fabricating in my mind uh, thoughts about the talk tonight so I forgot the words I learned in Hindi today <laughs> it'll come back after <laughs> hmm. good okay day three ah, it's getting happy over here <laughs> good 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 hmm. tonight what will it be? So there's a few things going on right now. Day three, day four of the retreat is usually a time when things start to happen. <laughs> Whether it's in one direction or the other. Um, usually day three or four people will usually brighten up. And there's some good momentum in the heart. And it rises up the corners of the mouth and it's getting genuine actually it's not so forced so starting to see that more and more that's a very good sign <laughs> and then also it's a time when if there are deeper things inside they will usually also become more manifest so it's either way and sometimes it's a bit of a mix so it's a a bit of a mixed bag we, we never really know what the retreats are going to bring and so um, I think though it's going quite well <laughs> from what I can tell in interviews um, so I was wondering about the talk tonight because I wasn't sure of the direction sorry and so I finally this mind started to appreciate the idea of um, trying to move towards a deeper explanation of practicing metta in different ways and so I don't know why this image of a flower came into my mind <laughs> and I think this is uh, gonna be the talk tonight uh, it's going to be called full bloom but to for ha to have a flower reaching full bloom we need to start with the roots so if we take care of the roots then the rest will just happen <laughs> and often we think of a flower for its beauty its petals not in everything and that's what we want kind of thing but 
uh, there's no blooming if there's no taking care of the roots. So there will be two uh, levels to this talk tonight. I will begin with the simile of the saw and uh, a little bit of a deeper exploration of how the Buddha taught metta, uh, not just in this regular sequence that we hear, but uh, with beautiful analogies and a little bit more flesh around the, the bone here. And then we will explore. Uh, they go quite well together because the first one is really giving a lot of depth into really how the Buddha meant it, that we should practice metta, and it becomes very clear. And then move into another sutta, a discourse that is called, I call it filled with love or accompanied with loving kindness, basically. It's called the Mitta Sahagata Sutta. And so this is the discourse where the Buddha explains the limit of metta, the, how to practice it completely, um, which was a very definite feature of his teaching. His teaching around the Brahma Viharas was very unique and very complete. And Twim, Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, Bhante Vimala Ramsey's teaching is actually based on that sutta for its progression, which people are now starting to experience. So that's why I want to touch upon this. And to open this, I would like to again begin with a poem. <laughs> um, because we'll start at the root and sometimes we practice the metta and this came up a few times today and yesterday actually. We practice the metta and metta is so wholesome that whatever we're keeping inside is going to come up. So anything that we have been repressing or anything that we kind of nicely tucked away in our lives so that we don't have to look at it, it will have to come up because we're cultivating a completely open heart and mind. Actually, we were kind of laughing with Delson because he kept uh, doing these uh, shameless plugs for his book. And actually, my name, my, the, book of my, the name of my book is called Open Heart. And, uh, <laughs> so we kind of were uh, making fun of that together. He was like, just like saying a mind without craving all the time. And, and so we thought it was really, uh, it, it went well together because what, when you don't have craving, you, you have an open heart. So. craving, <laughs> <laughs> open So, and I like to just start with a bit of humanness and um, really uh, this, this uh, poem is from Dilruba Ahmed and uh, it's called Phase One and it's, a, it's about forgiveness basically and it's a really, uh, it's a really beautiful day-to-day -day kind, of, uh, kind of exposition, demonstration of just, you know, nothing complicated or, but it, it's really, it, in its own way, it has a lot of depth. And this is actually from a, um, a student of mine in Canada who uh, she sent it to me. She thought it was good, so uh, many merits to her. <laughs> so, for leaving the fridge open last night, I forgive you. For conjuring white curtains instead of living your life. For the seedlings that wilt now in tiny pots, I forgive you. For saying no first and yes as an afterthought, I forgive you for the hideous visions of th after childbirth brought on by loss of sleep, and when the baby woke repeatedly for your silent rebuke in the dark, what's your beef? I forgive your letting vines overtake the garden for fearing your own propensity to love, for losing again your bag en route from San Francisco, for the equally heedless drive back on the caffeine fuel return. I forgive you for leaving windows open in rain and soaking library books again. 
for putting forth only revisions of yourself with punctuation worked over instead of the disorganized truth, I forgive you. For singing mostly when the shower drowns your voice. For so admiring the drummer you failed to hear the drum. May forgiveness gather, pooling in gutters gushing from pipes, a great steady rain of olives from branches, relieved from cruelty and petty meanness. With it a flurry of wings, thirteen grey pigeons, ointment reserved for healers and prophets, I forgive you, I forgive you. For feeling awkward and nervous without reason, for bearing key to empty vessel with such calm you worried you had perhaps no moral center at all, for treating your mother with contempt when she deserved compassion, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. For growing a capacity for love that is great but matched only perhaps by your loneliness, for being unable to forgive yourself first so you could then forgive others and at last find a way to become the love that you want to be in this world. So it's a little heavier, <laughs> of course, but I said we would start with the root. So this is where we start and sometimes um, I I kind of liked this really honest view about uh, that author's personal experience, her personal life, and I think there's a lot of things that we can all relate to in this because when we speak about spirituality and you know uh, developing awakening and all that, we can get really esoteric, but then in real life it looks more like this. <laughs> And this is why I mention this tonight, is because uh, sometimes people uh, will feel heavier emotions and need to hear things, how to deal with that. And then that's why the second fold of the, the talk tonight will move more towards, okay, so when, what to do when we come out of this and uh, make the mind uh, unshakable and unshaken. But first, sometimes we need to kind of dig in and purify what's in there. So this is uh, where I'll be reading the simile of the saw. Um, so it begins with this Molya Paguna, and Molya Paguna is um, associating a lot with the bikunis and uh, a little too much. <laughs> and he's starting to be really fond of them, and they're starting to be really fond of him. And, um, I mean, that wouldn't necessarily be a problem, but it turns into very unwholesome. So he's making a bit of a mess, and um, they're also making a bit of a mess, and then it's creating a lot of problems in the Sangha. And then the Buddha hears about this and um, says that, uh, well, bring, bring this Moldya Paguna to me, and we'll have a little discussion. So basically, whenever somebody would say something to those bikunis that which was not really nice, he would just lose his mind and become angry and just <laughs> so, and he's a monk, so that's not really proper. Um, and then they would do the same for him. And so when he comes to the Buddha, then the Buddha explains to him, you know, uh, Bhante would say, "Don't make a big deal out of it." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And um, this is basically what the Buddha is telling Moldya Paguna, but in a different way. <laughs> and you might be wondering, like, why am I choosing to say that? But real the reality is, it doesn't mean that it, it, because it's the same situation that's going to happen for you. The thing is that that's an example, but this kind of situation can arise for, from many things. And it's just because we, we really take it personal and really feed into it and make a big deal out of it that we get to the state where there's anger or strong reaction. So it doesn't mean that you're associating with 
bikunis or whatever, <laughs> but whatever hindrance arises for you, and if it overruns the mind, then this teaching is also applicable. applicable. So basically, whatever happens for you, whatever, if it's a person, a situation, uh, name it, then this is how you should train. My mind will be unshaken and I will not retaliate with hurtful speech. I will dwell with a heart full of love, caring for their well-being, not obsessed by anger. This is how you should train. Then the Buddha addressed the monks. Once the monks pleased my mind by their, by their manners. When, at a certain time, I said, Monks, I eat food only once a day. By eating only a single meal per day, I know of no disease. I live at ease, free from sickness, with lightness and strength. In the same way, monks eat only a single meal per day. Then also you will know of no disease. You will live at ease, free from sickness, with lightness and strength. And I did not have to repeatedly teach the monks. I only had to arouse awareness in them. So that's also touching upon really uh, the faith or the con confidence into really listening and bringing forth the practice. Just as if there were at a crossroad on level grounds, a chariot tied with swift horses standing with gold ready. Then a skilled charioteer, a trainer of horses, would climb in. He would grab the reins in his left hand and grab the goad in his right hand, and he could go wherever he liked. So they would have like a car, <laughs> maybe keys. <laughs> in the same way, monks, I did not have to repeatedly teach the monks. I only had to spark their attention. <coughs> Monks, abandon unwholesome states and be relentless in cultivating wholesome ones. This is how you will come upon growth, increase, and prosperity in this Dhamma and way of life. Monks, just as if close to a village or town, there was a great sultry grove covered with castor bean, castor bean plant. Then someone would come up wanting it to live, wanting it to thrive, wanting its liberation. That person would cut down the saplings that were frail, crooked, and drawing vitality and would bring them away, completely clearing the inner grove. And that person would carefully tend to the young saplings which were strong and upright then the sultry grove would quickly come to growth, increase, and prosperity. In the same way, monks abandon unwholesome states and be relentless in wholesome ones. This is how you will come to growth, increase, and prosperity in this Dhamma and discipline. So, sometimes we experience uh, coarser hindrances that would arise and sometimes the mind really starts to believe it. <laughs> it really believes the hindrance itself whereas the hindrance is only a distraction, it's only a disturbance in the mind and this is always very essential to remember. And even if we have a hard time believing or seeing actually that it's working or seeing the fruit of this practice, that's when we, uh, we recommend to actually uh, go all in with faith. And that's why we take the refuges and the precepts in the morning also, is that for these 10 days you are taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And please do your best to follow instructions, to follow what the Buddha is saying without, uh, without doubting, without doubting. And then steadiness will arise in the practice. And even if we don't see that, even if the hindrances keep coming up, then they will wear away eventually.
And here we have the story of uh, Countess Wedehika, who uh, um, is a good example of um, being the importance of being honest and actually genuine with uh, our practice, with uh, what we say or on interviews. I'm not saying that people are not being genuine. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying it's really important, basically, so that to to uh, a teacher cannot help if, if there are some things that are hidden or things like that. So I'm saying this because we're talking about the roots here. So this will actually nurture everything else. This is really the base. So the story of Miss Wedehika. In the past monks, in this very Savati, there was an influential, influential countess named Wedehika. The Countess Wedehika's beautiful renown was such. The Countess Wedehika is pious. She is humble and serene. Now Countess Wedehika had a servant named Kali, who was skilled, steadfast, and well organized in her work. One day the servant Kali thought, this beautiful renown of my ladies is as such the Countess Wedehika is pious, humble, and serene. But how is it in reality? <laughs> is my noble lady really peaceful, though she harbors anger within? And it is simply not showing. Is it only because my work is well organized that my noble lady appears peaceful? Though she harbors anger within, and it is simply not showing. What if I were to test my noble lady? Then the servant Kali decided to get up after sunrise. The Countess Wedehika said to Kali, Hey Kali, yes noble lady, why do you wake up past sunrise? For nothing, my lady. You wake up past sunrise for nothing, you say, huh? You wicked slave. She shouted angry and enraged. Then the servant Kali thought, Surely there is anger within my noble lady, and it is simply not showing. <laughs> what if I were to test my noble lady a little further? So then the servant Kali got up even later in the day, Countess Wedehika said to her, Hey, Kali, yes, noble lady, why do you get up still later in the day? For nothing, noble lady. You wake up even later for nothing, you say, huh, you wicked slave. She shouted angry and enraged and launched into spiteful speech. I'm not really enacting this very well, but <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Then the servant Kali thought, Surely there is anger within my noble lady, and it is simply not showing. What if I were to test my, little, my lady a little further? Then Kali got up even later in the day, and Countess Vidahika said, Hey, Kali, yes, noble lady. Why do you get up still later in the day? For nothing, noble lady. You wake up even later in the day for nothing, you say, huh, wicked slave. She shouted, angry and enraged, and she grabbed a long bolt and gave her a blow on the head and cut her head open. Is <laughs> Lay? Lay blood? Lay cake? Lay? Huh? Yeah. Uh, same in singular. <laughs> Shocked with the cut on her head, bleeding profusely. Profusely. Sorry, my first language is French, if you haven't noticed yet. So, um, <laughs> that's what you're hearing. <laughs> 
Kali went up to the neighbors and said, Look at the pious lady's work. Look at the humble lady's work. Look at the serene lady's work. In what name can she become angry and enraged at her only servant for waking up late to then grab a long boat and hit her on the head? Then no longer after a terrible report spread about about Ms. Vedehika saying Countess Vedehika is violent, she is fierce and unstoppable. So this is really interesting because we, uh, we can see that a lot, in fact, especially in the spiritual community, <laughs> where we all practice and we're all pretty zen on retreat and uh, everything is going well. <laughs> but um, it's only when we come upon unpleasant situations that we can really see what's going on. <laughs> and so, but these coarser situations, still they are our teachers, so it's not actually negative. And when, um, well, for example, uh, sometimes I say some, some people think like they're awakened or something, then I just say, that, go spend some time with your family, like, like two, three months, <laughs> and then we'll talk again. <laughs> if you think you don't have any anger anymore or something. <laughs> so it's negative, but not at the same time. It's actually, for me, in... For example, in my own practice, it's these moments that I'm looking for. Not when everything is going well, because that's easy. Of course it's going well, nothing's happening. <laughs> like, you're not going to see when you get angry. But it's when things don't go the way that you want them to be, when things get rough, when things are coarse, then that's when it's good to keep an eye out. Yes. <laughs> Similarly, monks, should there be a monk here who looks kinder than kindness, gentler than gentleness, calmer than calmness? I feel pretty targeted because I'm the only monk here. <laughs> <laughs> he may well be so as long as he does not come upon unpleasant speech. But it is when that monk comes upon unpleasant speech that it can be known if he truly is kind, truly is gentle, and truly is calm. I call not a monk respectful, he who is respectful only for the sake of robes, food, shelter, and medicine, and who pretends to be respectful. Why? Because that monk, when he does not get robes, food, shelter, and medicine, is not respectful, and he stops pretending to be respectful. <laughs> but a monk who is, respectfully, who is respectful because he esteems the Dhamma, respects the Dhamma, thinks highly of Dhamma, reveres the Dhamma, praises the Dhamma, that monk behaves respectfully. Him I call respectful. So don't worry, this is not targeted to anybody here. <laughs> it's actually just part of the sutta and we're just going through it. But um, I think it's quite interesting anyways, even though it's not really touching, uh, this is not my goal to be touching anybody here with these uh, words. But to put things into context, he's talking about Molya Paguna here. So Molya Paguna was probably one of those people that didn't maybe ordain for the right reasons so and that happened <laughs> you know that happened quite a bit and the buddha had to kind of make straight lines around that so there's a few stories in the discourses of the buddha where some monks didn't behave very well and that's kind of like the sutta goes around that that doesn't mean that everything is applicable to to us right now here Therefore, monks, thinking we will be respectful because we esteem the Dhamma, respect the Dhamma, think highly of the Dhamma, revere the Dhamma, praise the Dhamma. This is how you should train monks. I still think it's quite beautiful. So, yeah, we should all train like that. <laughs> These are five possible manners of speech that others could say to you. 
Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or false, soft or harsh, bent on goodness or bent on harm, with a loving mind or with inner hate. And this is true for speech, but this is true for any hindrances that arises in your mind. It still holds true what the Buddha would, will say here. If others should speak to you, if hindrances should speak to you in this way, in any of those manners, you should train in this way. Our minds will remain unshaken and we will not retaliate with hurtful words. We will dwell with a heart full of love, caring for their well-being, sending metta to your hindrances. That sounds like a good idea. Not obsessed by anger or impatience, not letting the hindrances overwhelm, overrun your mind, basically. Timely, untimely, true or false, soft or harsh, bent on good or bent on harm, and loving or hating. We will dwell suffusing that person with a heart filled with love and with this as a support, we will dwell suffusing the all-encompassing universe with a heart filled with love, vast, expanded, boundless, without anger or resentment. This is how you should train monks. And in fact, I'm reading this sutta tonight mostly because of that section. So this is really where I want to put the emphasis on. This is really what matters for us right now. And this is a bit more uh, fleshy here for us. So this is uh, something that people are starting to experience. We've been developing the spiritual friend. And I thought this was uh, very interesting because, yes, it's talking about someone who's harassing us, for example, and then we start with that person, sending that person loving kindness, but that person doesn't need to be a, <laughs> a terrible person. <laughs> it can also be a spiritual friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, uh, I thought it was really interesting though, because it's one of the places in the suttas where the Buddha actually makes this difference where he's starting with a person, sending metta to a person, and then using that as a support. And this is what we've been doing for the past three days, was to use a spiritual friend as a support. And then now, uh, a lot of people's minds have gotten lighter. Uh, smiles are arising quite uh, much more easily. And so, um, the awareness of metta in this particular tradition um, now kind of uh, goes up into the head. Uh, I'll, I'll give you more. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what's happening here is that at the beginning mind is very agitated. Then we start picking up the practice and then it takes quite some time and we can't force this. It's just a matter of taking a step back, letting things cool down, and cultivating wholesome states as much as we can. Then the mind gets uplifted. <clears throat> that, was another, that was my word today. Yes, yes, very good. So I just lost my train of thought because <laughs> obviously. Yes, so it comes, we say it goes into the head, but what really happens, this is just to, so that people, usually they relate to that. But what happens is that because mindfulness is so uplifted now, it's, it's gotten... Um, this little uh, upliftment from the, the, the metta, the loving kindness, and the smiling. Hopefully, everybody's smiling. Is everybody smiling? Yes, <laughs> all day? Yeah? Is it hurting? Yeah, a lot of people say it hurts. And then they're like, can I stop? I, I'm like, no. <laughs> no, that's where it actually starts to get good. <laughs> so, good. And then the thing is uh, awareness of body. 
is very is very solid. It's very heavy, and it's got full. Of, it's full of things in it. It's got lots of sensations, and uh, it's it's heavy on the mind. And the mind actually, at this moment, after meditating and purifying quite a bit, it's not really interested in the body anymore. So what happens is, is that it's just starting to retract from the body and people start to lose sensation for example they won't feel their their thighs or their legs or their hands and so when this starts to happen it's not because you're actually disappearing <laughs> but it's simply that would be awesome but <laughs> um, but really what is happening is that m mind only seeks the point of lowest tension so it wants to be freer and freer and this awareness of body is kind of weighing it down and so it's kind of moving away from that and by the way the point of lowest tension is not an original so all credits go to uh, Venerable Metananda so whenever uh, <laughs> that's not for me um, but it's really good <laughs> I knew the principle, but I didn't have the words to say it. <laughs> so, and then what happens is that, and this is really where our, this practice is very differentiated from other kinds of one-pointed forced awareness or one-pointed focuses, focuses, where we would force awareness on a single point, and that's what, what would, with time, be, make the mind kind of together and that's a forceful way the thing with that is like temporarily you won't have hindrances arising because you're basically with the force of this kind of awareness you're basically suppressing everything else from arising in your field of vision mental field of vision and when the thing is um, when we stop forcing this kind of awareness then everything comes back rushing in double time the force and so the hindrances come back and then we have to force even more for them not to come because they're rushing in with a lot of force uh, and we're getting used to this more and more tight kind of one point in this yes, the ball Un under the water yes yes I got it <laughs> <laughs> I don't didn't understand but I saw you doing it I was like yeah, I think I know <laughs> good yes so and this is one way it does get unified it, that's, that's true yes I, I can give them that um, but what we are doing here is a little bit more elaborate. You don't have as much, like, um, it's not as instantaneous. Like, I could just look at that microphone really intensely and, like, whoosh, kind of absorb into that perception. But with us, it comes through wisdom, and it takes a little bit longer because we need to understand a few things which are completely essential to practice what we're practicing here. So that really uh, briefly, because I've talked about this already, that wholesome states actually uplift the mind and are basically um, cohesive in themselves. So the mind isn't, it's not distracted, uh, letting go of unwholesome states uh, that are agitating, that are distracting and cultivating wholesome states like metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, or the four satipatthanas, uh, which we will get into a little bit later. So the mind does not get concentrated, it gets collected, or composed, or harmonious, basically, that's what happens. Because when the mind is happy, is very wholesome, it's not actually wanting anything else. So it's not flowing anywhere. It's, not, it's got nowhere to go. It doesn't want to go anywhere because it's happy here and now. And that's the collectedness of mind that we experience in this 
particular teaching. That's kind of what I call the pooling of awareness, basically. That's what samadhi is, is that it's like it's raining on a very big leaf and then slowly it's just starting to pool in the middle. And uh, because our, our awareness is, is kind of uh, scattered <laughs> most of the time, we'll be thinking of this and it's like a, the same thing that you would do to a computer, like a, you defragment a computer I don't know if you're, you have some tech, uh, tech people in here. <laughs> so the memory on the computer gets fragmented because it does so many things. And at some point you have to put it back together so that it's running again smoothly. So basically we're just learning to um, let go of unwholesome states and that's kind of like the inclination that it needs. And then the pooling it just comes, the wholesome states with the wholesome states. Uh, awareness starts to gather just naturally we don't uh, we you can't force this it only comes through wisdom so it takes a few days but then the thing is you get wiser <laughs> you get smarter you get to recognize unwholesome hurtful states and you get to cultivate and develop a desire for cultivating happy uplifted states and then the beauty of this is that, <clears throat> yes, we go deeper in the meditation, but when we're not meditating, we're still meditating. It's, it's an all the time practice. Bhante would say, I wrote a book on it. It's called Life is Meditation, Meditation is Life. <laughs> he would say that all the time. And, and he's right. <laughs> and that's the best part. And when we practice in this way, when we sit, when we stand, when, when we cook, it's the same thing. It's bhavana. Like you don't need to be sitting to, to meditate, to cultivate your mind. It's, it's all the time, literally. There's no break. That's why I said yesterday, it's your job. Like right now, your job is to do right effort, practice the six R's, stay with your friend, love your spiritual friend, and stay with your meditation all the time. And that collectedness, because it comes through wisdom, through un our understanding of things, the way things are, Dhamma, basically, that's what it means. It stays with us. And we don't have to force this. It, it stays so much longer. Because then we just know, we just know that these wholesome states, we just have to bring them up. And, and then the mind gets collected very quickly, very easily. And it's very easy to maintain, actually, a lot more easy to, than, than any kind of forceful uh, concentration practice. And so we, we can actually uh, really notice a change within ourselves too, and that's really beautiful. That's really when we know that we're practicing the right way, the four qualities of the Sangha, basically. Amen. Acha. And here there are a few very good analogies that I, that I kind of I really like about uh, uh, how the, the Buddha brings this, uh, these analogies around practicing boundless metta and how, uh, how powerful it can be if we practice it like this. And I'm opening it up today because some people are starting to radiate to the directions and the, the metta is changing slowly. For some people, I would say, uh, quite a few people actually. And so this is also helpful to nourish, to nurture that, uh, uh, that blooming. And that's why the, I wanted to call this talk the full bloom. Just as if a person would arrive with a shovel and a basket and say, I shall take away the earth from this great big earth. <laughs> he would dig some soil here and there, and he would scatter some soil here and there. He would spit here and there, and he would urinate here and there, saying, be without earth, be without earth. What do you think, monks? Could that person take away the earth from this great big earth? No, Bhante. Why? 
Why so? Because, Bhante, this great big earth is deep and immeasurable. It's not easy or possible to take away its earth. That person could only reap misery and disappointment. Therefore, monks, if any others or if your hindrances should speak to you in any of the past ways mentioned, you should train our minds will be unshaken and I will not retaliate with hurtful words. We will dwell with a heart full of love, caring for their well-being, not obsessed by anger. We will dwell suffusing that person with a heart filled with love. And with this as a support, we will dwell suffusing the all-encompassing universe with a heart like the earth. Vast, expanded, boundless, without anger nor resentment. This is how you should train monks. Just, that, just as if a person were to come with yellow, blue and red paint and would say, I shall paint shapes in the air and I shall make forms appear in the air. What do you think, monks? Could that person paint shapes in the air and make forms appear? No, Bhante. Why so? Because, Bhante, space is without form, without attribute. It is not possible to paint shapes on it and make forms appear. That person could only reap misery and disappointment. In the same way, monks, you should train, our minds will remain unshaken and we will not retaliate with hurtful words. We will dwell with a heart full of love and caring for their well-being, not obsessed by anger. We will dwell suffusing that person with a heart filled with love and with this as a support, we will dwell suffusing the all-encompassing universe with a heart like space, vast, expanded, boundless, without anger nor resentment. This is how you should train. Just as if a person were to come with a blazing grass torch and would say, with my blazing grass torch, I shall burn away and dry up the river Ganges. What do you think, monks? Could that person burn away and dry up the river Ganges with a blazing grass torch? No, Bhante. Why? Because, Bhante, the river Ganges is deep and immeasurable. It's not possible to burn it away or dry it up with a blazing grass torch. That person could only reap misery and disappointment. Similarly, monks, you should train. Our minds will be unshaken and we will not retaliate with hurtful words. We will dwell with a heart filled with love, caring for their well-being, not obsessed by anger. We will dwell suffusing that person with a heart filled with love. And with this as a support, we will dwell suffusing the all-encompassing universe with a heart like the river Ganges, vast, expanded, boundless, without anger or resentment. This is how you should train. So I thought this was kind of culturally appropriate analogy. <laughs> Since we're in India. Usually I say this in Canada, but it's, it's quite amazing. I'm just like, yeah, it's great. We actually have the river Ganges here. <laughs> hmm. And so just to ha have a quick look back on these three similes, which I find just wonderful. Um, the, art, the heart like the earth. Uh, the heart like space, the heart like the river Ganges. How beautiful is that? <laughs> and I think this is uh, such a beautiful way to nourish our practice and to really feel the depth of what the Buddha meant when, you know, when we practice this, uh, it has to be genuine. It has to be like fully devoted to this. And this is how it becomes we become unshakable, we become not affected by these things outside the world. We're only devoted fully to these wholesome states. And actually, this is practicing 
the highest kind of generosity. So how can we be affected if our heart is like space? Anything that will come is just this little thing. It's just this little speck. And that's what I said to a few people today on interviews in explaining that radiating to the direction, in fact, is helping us to open up the mind, basically. Or standing on top of the, the Jet Van, the first, the first building there, the Forster Story building, and you can see like really far on the horizon. And um, thinking how massive this earth is. <laughs> and, you know, whatever, if you develop a heart like the earth, like how amazing is that? Like what can actually get to you? <laughs> Not much. And then obviously the River Ganges is uh, another really helpful uh, vision to, to help us if we have something, you know, arriving and striking really. Well, what if we were to actually understand and see our practice, our metta practice and our heart just like so deep and so vast moving body of water that is just like easing and cooling and washing and damping everything on its path. It's quite, uh, um, it's quite helpful to, to recollect when we have something happening. And this is also part of the six R's practice where we learn to take a step back. And awareness, actually when we do that, it becomes more spacious, more detached, and not so affected by all these things. And this is what makes it so vast, so big. Monks, even if brigands or spies were to come and sever you limb by limb with a two-handed saw, that's pretty violent. At that time, he who would harbor a hateful mind would not be practicing my teaching. At that time, one should train in this way, our minds will be unshaken and we will not retaliate with hurtful words. We will dwell with a heart full of love, caring for their well-being and not obsessed by anger. We will dwell suffusing that person with a heart filled with love and with this as a support, we will dwell suffusing the all-encompassing universe with a heart filled with love, vast, expanded, boundless, without anger or resentment. This is how you should train. Monks, you should frequently call to mind the analogy of the saw. Seeing in such a way, monks, could there be any manner of speech, subtle or rough, that you could not endure? No, Bhante. Then frequently call to mind the analogy of the saw. This will be for your welfare and happiness for a long time. This is what the Awakened One said. The monks were uplifted by the, uh, the Awakened One's words. So whenever you have uh, bigger uh, monsters coming out of the closet, uh, coming out of the basement, um, I thought I would just offer this uh, reflection tonight because it's a powerful reflection on how to put things in perspective, uh, how to manage these um, coarser situations that might arise from our past or from our conditionings or whatever it might be from other people. But this really points to the depth of our practice also, the power of our practice. I mean, if the Buddha even says that somebody would come and basically uh, turn you into pieces, I had to say, a, let's say, a, a better kind of <laughs> approach to it. <laughs> so that's really how much he actually means it. Uh, the, the practice that we should practice metta to that level. So it's pretty profound. <laughs> and so I wanted to also bring that up tonight so to bring uh, a little bit more understanding about the depth of the devotion we have to have in this practice, like fully devoted to this. If there's hindrances arising, no big deal, no big deal. 
it's actually you're doing quite well compared to. <laughs> <laughs> And how do we let go? Good, good. <laughs> Just checking, nobody's sleeping or something. <laughs> I'm looking at the time and it's, it's getting late. It's 8.30. Um, I'm not used to, you know, uh, the, the dual formula. So um, I'm not sure. I'm kind of uh, wondering if I should launch into the other one or how much I should launch into the other one. Um, it's kind of it's it's kind of nice because it gives this other kind of uh, part of the path how to bring that a little bit further even. Um, maybe I think uh, I could give a brief version and we could uh, we could uh, actually fly through it a little bit. Yeah, would that be okay? Huh? Yeah, well, I mean, there's always a way to make it big, but <laughs> uh, there's also ways to make it shorter. Um, I just like to share this sutta because it's um, it's so it's like the skeleton of this practice of twim. So um, it's quite it's quite good to to hear uh, to hear. Uh, where that comes from, because then we can actually really understand uh, what's going on. Okay, so I'll give a very brief version. I'll really cut it down to the core. <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, so basically what happens here is that a few monks are going to see other set, other um, pr spiritual practitioners from other traditions at their ashrams basically and they're uh, talking about the developing of the development of the brahma viharas the metta karuna mudita upeka loving kindness compassion joy equanimity and so basically what to keep it short what they're saying is that well we're practicing the same thing so they're saying yeah we, we also spread metta to all the whole encompassing universe and to all living beings and all of this and then the compassion and then the joy and they say basically we do that too so what's the difference and then the monks don't really know what to reply so <laughs> they go back to the buddha and say well, well we're, we're just going to ask the teacher <laughs> so when they come to the buddha uh, they ask their questions and the buddha says well, when these wanderers from other traditions say this, you should ask them, how is the liberation of the heart by boundless, by boundless love should, uh, developed? How is it developed? Where does it lead to? What is its limit? What is its fruit? And what, it, what is its culmination? And similarly for boundless compassion, boundless joy, boundless equanimity. So ask in this way, monks, practitioners from other teachings will be unable to proceed further and they will be most likely at a loss. Why? Because, monks, it is not their field, not their domain. Monks, I see nobody in this world of devas and maras and brahmas, of samanas and brahmanas, this era of kings and people who could satisfy a person's mind by answering this other than the truth finder himself or one of his disciples or one who has heard it from them and this is also something that came up today and what's the difference you know between uh, between other ways of practicing loving kindness and in this particular way well this particular way actually we're using the six r's and we are moving progressively detaching and moving away and liberating the mind as we proceed so we do not remain attached to any of those and the brahma viharas they become clearer and brighter and more purified and they change also so there's a really it's a very dynamic evolving uh, meditation it's not just one instruction on day zero and that's all you're doing during the 10 days. Actually, we really do need to see each other for interviews, monitor the progress, see what's going on, 
and then nudge in certain ways. And this is why even in Buddhism today, um, this teaching, the, the deeper teachings on loving kindness have been lost, basically. Um, because uh, what most people will teach is continuously repeating words. And that doesn't go past even to the second jhana. <laughs> so that doesn't go deep at all. <laughs> Because the second jhana is where vitaka and vichara cease, basically, or they really fade down. So if we keep bringing up visualizations, Im imagination, words, thinking processes, then we're constantly keeping our mind <coughs> coarse, and we're, not, we're never letting go of that. So we're never really going deep at all. And so that's why nowadays metta is considered a kind of a surface practice, which doesn't really go deep. And it's just because it's misunderstood. So we need the six R's to deepen the practice also. And that's just uh, very essential. And this sutta actually explained this. It doesn't talk about the six R's, but it does in its own way. And, uh, and that's why nowadays uh, you would take a 10-day retreat, for example. And, you know, the metta is like that 10-minute thing that you do at the end of a 10-day retreat. And that's it. <laughs> but here, this is what we do the whole 10 days. Well, not the whole 10 days, but for, for quite a while. And uh, actually, really seeing the progression through the Brahma Viharas, through each of them. And how is the liberation of the heart by love developed? Where does it lead to? Where, what is its limit? What is its fruit? What is its culmination? Here, monks, one develops the, awaken, the awakening support of awareness filled with love, supported by letting go, calming down, release, culminating in liberation. So here we see in those four qualities is very close to the six R's, uh, supported by letting go, calming down, release, and uh, culminating in liberation, basically. And this is what the six R's do. Of course, there's not the smiling in there, you might be wondering, but it's coming up because we're going to go through each of the seven supports of awakening and joy is right in the middle of that. So we start, there is awareness, that first support of awakening, and it's filled with love and it's supported by the six R's basically, so that we make sure that this is going to go the right direction basically. We're not going to get stuck there, we're going <laughs> to keep progressing. Then afterwards, one develops the awakened support of investigation filled with love. So that's when there's a distraction or that's when you need to tell like, I'm staying with the metta uh, or I'm six Ring. That, that's the investigation of state here is just seeing the hindrance and then letting it go, applying the six R's. One develops the awakened support, the awakening support of energy filled with love. So we do that continuously over and over again, over and over again. Supported by letting go, calming down, release, and that culminates in liberation. One develops the awakening support of joy filled with love. So this is one of the places that we actually really see that he's giving clear instructions on that. <laughs> um, and how, how do we feel joy. <laughs> Smarting. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Can you explain the difference between happiness and joy? Joy, yes. Well, there's are all kind of theories around that. Um, I mean, usually sukha is defined as more like happiness, uh, and joy is more the, the piti that people will uh, ascribe to. Um, one is more excited than the other. PT is more excited, but it is a factor of the first jhana, so it has to come up. It, it's, it's that cleaning agent, like that coarser cleaning agent of the mind kind of thing. It will come up and then it will clean the mind and it will make it very nice and sparkly and clean and then it will just calm down. <laughs> it did its job. So the, the trick question I always ask is like, can you uh, like 
can you actually feel joy without smiling? <laughs> it's pretty hard, actually. <laughs> if you join, it's like... <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> without smiling, yes. So, actually, you know, people, when they, because this word has been translated in so many ways, the word piti, it's like also translated as rapture and all these really big terms. And it makes it very kind of esoteric. And, and the way that absorption jhana are nowadays understood, it makes it really unaccessible. And people say, oh, no, this is just, you know, this is only something that you can experience if you're a monk and you're meditating for like two years in a row and, and then you absorb into the nimitta after uh, access concentration and all this commentary material. Very, very esoteric and it feels very complicated and far away where, you know, or you could just smile. <laughs> And you will see that it actually works. If you, if you practice in this way with the six R's, you just, it just makes sense. What the Buddha says is so actually simple and so clear. You can't really make it better. <laughs> it's, it's just so, so clear. And you remember the gladness to collectedness sequence that I've been talking quite a bit about. That's how the mind gets collected, like some uh, sukhino chittang samadhi yati. This is how the mind gets collected through happiness. Well, the seven supports of awakening. This is exactly that sequence, and he is basically giving it to us on a plate here, explaining the seven supports of awakening. First, with awareness with metta. Then there's investigation of states. That's just when you see the hindrances. That's the recognized step. But you need awareness for that first. <laughs> and, then, and then you do that continuously, then the mind gets pure, it gets bright, it gets uplifted, then there's joy arising, obviously. And then the next support, he says, then you develop the support of calm or tranquility. And that's just the byproduct of the, what happened before with the joy continually arising from the effort. Then the mind calms down also. And then when the mind gets calm, then it becomes collected because it's not agitated anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't waver. And then it just pools into, oh, <laughs> into right here, or depending on where you want it to be, but it's like in the middle here. <laughs> and, um, and this is a natural process. By understanding this, this is how it happens, and this is how we can experience that. It's a natural process. We don't need to force it. And then what happens afterwards? There is the joy, then there's the mind calms down, then it gets collected, and then when it's collected, de facto, it becomes steady. Because it's not, you know, it's not going all over the place. And when I translate the word upekka, mm -hmm. In relation to the bojangas, the seven supports of awakening, I always call it steadiness of mind instead of equanimity, which is something that for me makes a lot more sense. Uh, I think it was maybe because of my previous practices, which I won't name, but um, I was told to remain equanimous through a lot of pain, and the word equanimity became really, really dry to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I happily changed it <laughs> to something that was more meaningful to me. And actually the word upekka comes from upa ishka, which means also on looking. And to me, I think, is a lot closer to the actual meaning. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but that's something I understood from that, uh, breaking the word apart, apart basically. And then we see the whole loop happening. When, when the mind gets collected, it gets steady. Then what does that make? That makes more awareness. When whatever other hindrances are going to come up, we're just going to be more aware of it, obviously. It, and then it makes so much sense. OK, so now he goes on to a, a, another elaboration. And I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to go right to the, what is the, <laughs> uh, 
what is the limit of the fruit? Where does it lead to? And he says, Having discarded both the favorable and unfavorable, let me live calm, present, and fully conscious. Calm, one then meditates present and fully conscious with that loving kindness. One meditates then, having arrived at the liberation of the beautiful, Subha. Monks, I say that the liberation of the heart by love has the beautiful as its limit. And now you're probably wondering, what is the beautiful? That is usually a word for the fourth jhana. And so that is why... Yes. Here for a wise monk who has not discerned a higher liberation. And so now we've gone through the main template. And he does the same thing with boundless compassion, boundless joy, and then boundless equanimity, which I call calm, basically. And he breaks it down through the seven supports of awakening, each of them with that particular Brahma Vihara and supported by letting go, calming down, release, and that culminates into liberation or detaching. So, yes, go. So basically he is here saying that the metta doesn't go beyond the fourth jhana. It, it is too heavy to go beyond this. And the meditation changes, and this is what we do here in this practice also. And then basically he explains that um, with boundless compassion, it only goes to the plane of endless spaciousness or endless space. And then with joy, he says, the practice of boundless joy only need, leads to uh, the plane of endless consciousness. And the boundless equanimity, boundless calm, only leads to uh, the plane of nothingness, which I call bare awareness. So basically, this is, this is just for reference. Um, I will be giving a talk on the jhanas uh, later, maybe tomorrow, I'm not sure yet. But we will go through each of those uh, with the Brahma Viharas. But this is simply uh, also a really good sutta to know especially for you because uh, when we practice this um, there might be a lot of um, confrontation <laughs> regarding the way that uh, the teaching is being taught right now nowadays and so it's really good for us to have a solid proof of what we're practicing and this is why I kind of wanted to offer this tonight uh, it's written here I'm not making any of this up and we can see that where the six R's actually fit in there. We're talking about the seven supports of awakening. There is joy and there is the Brahma Viharas. And also we can see that the Brahma Viharas do not lead to Nibbana. They do not lead all the way. We're going to have to do an, a little step further <laughs> to, um, to step out of the, that amazing vehicle that is the Brahma Viharas and step into more... <clears throat> into a, a very fine satipatthana practice towards the end which we call the clear mind or the still mind or the uh, bhante likes to call it the exquisite stillness which is a pretty good word <laughs> and uh, because we cannot bring any kind of object further than this so we need to completely the six r's do lead to nibbana though uh, so we even six are all vehicles at that point. So, but I will be talking a bit more about this later on. Okay, so I will end the torture <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, do you have questions? But uh, I think probably everybody wants to go. One sticky note. Oh, is it something? Ah, at the time of forgiveness practice. At the time of forgiveness practice, what to do when pain occurs? So, what to do when pain occurs? Well, the pain can be either um, a real, a real problem that uh, let's say you have an injury and uh, you you should not try to push uh, too much 
the injury. Uh, there and then it's good to kind of take care of that or whatever uh, needs to be done. Uh, but also, uh, while practicing forgiveness, you can send forgiveness to the pain, literally. Um, and th the thing that happens with pain is that uh, we have this kind of biologically uh, ingrained reaction in us that every time we come upon hurt or pain, we cringe, basically. We kind of block, we, we lock, we, harmor our, we armor ourselves. And so we tend to create even more tension around the pain than what the actual pain is. So that's what the Buddha called the, the two darts, basically. There's the dart of the actual thing that's happening, the pain. But then 90% of that is the second dart, which is what we make of this. So forgiving the pain and actually uh, releasing and relaxing, really allowing the pain plenty of room to be and not cringing on it. And that will slowly open it up and obviously if it's an actual injury then it's good not to force it, but usually practicing like this the pain will actually go away. Oh. When is it that we actually practice forgiveness meditation? Uh, it's not something that I did recollect you talking about the thinking of the meditation. So I'm a bit lost on when actually do we deserve forgiveness in meditation? Uh -huh. Yes. Well, th this happens usually uh, when some bigger hindrances arise in people's practice. So, so it's a bit like. Um, it's a bit of a, like a side practice from what we practice here. It's really, a, a, it's really often practice, in fact, but usually we won't really um, talk much about it because uh, the, we try to basically give the main teaching, which is usually the, the main track that people will experience. But then we also, on the side, we will teach forgiveness when it is needed. So let's say on interviews, if something arises and then there's a lot of difficulties and things like that, like deeper blockages that need to be released, then, then we will move towards a forgiveness practice. Mm -hmm. And that's when we would talk more about it. Sometimes it happens, you know, at, at Damasuka, I was there for a whole summer with Bhante and uh, we would have, uh, well, quite rarely, but uh, we had a whole retreat that was all forgiveness. So it does happen, but it really depends on the group, the group dynamic, and uh, so, uh, so that these particular times, then we, we do speak more about it, obviously. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Rolling up the drums. Okay, I think we're good. Oh, <laughs> very good. Okay, let's share our merits and. Dukha patta jani dukha, bhaya patta jani bhaya, soka patta jani soka, hontu sabbe pani irang no punyang sabbe satta anu modantu. Sabba Sampati Siddhya Aga Satta Jabhumatta Devanaga Mahidika Punyang Tang Anumoritva Chirang Rakantu Sabba Sambuddha Sasana May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhus. Have a beautiful evening and rest. See you tomorrow.
So 